നെറ്റ് കണക്ഷൻ പോയോ കേൾക്കുന്നുണ്ടോ പറഞ്ഞേ ഓക്കെ Splitters! Wings! Spoiler alert! We're talking about aerodynamics! There are sleek cars and boxy cars. There's weird things sticking out of race cars and rice cars. And they're all trying to take advantage of aerodynamics. Aerodynamics is the study of how gases interact with moving objects. The two basic aerodynamic forces are drag and lift. Drag is the force air exerts against a car as it moves, while lift is the perpendicular force exerted by the air on the car. Lift includes both positive lift, that's the flying kind, and negative lift, and that's down force. Air moves in a very similar way to liquid. You just can't see it. If you think about it, every time you drive, you're practically swimming through an endless air ocean. Air obviously isn't as dense as liquid, but it's still touching stuff. So there's friction when something moves through it. And that makes drag probably the most important aerodynamic factor that we have to consider. And drag is basically a thing's velocity squared multiplied by its drag coefficient and its frontal area. Drag coefficient depends on a lot of factors, some of which are an object's overall shape, surface roughness, and speed. A brick has an awful drag coefficient of 1, while a teardrop, the most aerodynamic shape there is, has a drag coefficient of about 0.05. When you're loafing around at low speed, the air's not much to be worried about. So there's not much drag, and cars have plenty of power to push the air out of the way even if it's shaped like a brick. In the very early days of automobiles, manufacturers really didn't have to care about shape because cruising speeds barely got up to 45. I don't know. Maybe if the Model T was more aerodynamic, it could have gone 50. <laughs> the earliest land speed record racers quickly realized streamlining their cars are going to make it way better for going fast. Because of that velocity squared part of the equation, drag increases significantly the faster you go. Some might call it exponential. <laughs> at 70 miles an hour, there's four times more drag than there is at 35 miles an hour. That means it takes a lot more work to push something through the air. Looking at a fast moving, non-aerodynamic brick, air's going to pile up in front of it and create an area of high pressure there. At the back, a low pressure air pocket forms and creates a pressure differential. So not only is there frictional drag simply from the motion, now there's another force trying to drag the brick backwards. All this makes drag a really big factor in determining fuel efficiencies and top speeds. A reduction in drag coefficient from 0.3 to 0.25 would increase fuel economy by about a mile a gallon. By the same reasoning, an electric car can go further on a charge the more aerodynamic it is. That's why they look so weird. Now that we're regularly cruising at speeds over 70 miles an hour, we got a new focus on fuel efficiency or battery range. Production car designers try to get the lowest drag coefficients possible. Most modern cars have a drag coefficient somewhere between 0.25 and 0.35. With SUVs and trucks, somewhere around 0.3 and 0.4. The electric Tesla Model X is a super slick crossover with one of the lowest drag coefficients of any production car, 0.24. But if two different cars are going the same speed, there can still be more overall drag on the really aerodynamic bigger car than on a less aerodynamic smaller car. You can calculate how draggy a particular thing is by multiplying its drag coefficient by its frontal area, which is called drag area. 
Let's compare the slippery Model X to the Nissan 350Z, which has a mediocre CD of 0.31. With a frontal area of 20.88 square feet, it's got a drag area of 6.47. The Model X has a larger frontal area, 27.88 square feet, and with its low 0.24 drag coefficient, it has a bigger drag area of 6.69. And therefore, it's got a bit more drag. More drag! So maybe now you're thinking, hey, F1 cars are really fast. I bet they're crazy aerodynamic. Well, you'd be wrong. They have a drag coefficient of about 0.7. That's more than a minivan, what? F1 cars and most race cars are designed mostly with lift in mind. Traction and grip are just as important to fast lap times as speed and power. Turns out, keeping a car from flying off of the ground helps improve grip. And pressing down on the tires with negative lift, downforce, improves grip even more. Downforce also creates a ton of drag, but the trade-off is worth it. Because without all that downforce, F1 cars would still be spinning their tires at 100 miles an hour. And with extra force pressing toward the tires, they get increased lateral grip for better cornering speed. A heavy car could achieve the same result, but it wouldn't be able to accelerate or corner as well as the light ones. So what's creating that lift or downforce? Like our super draggy fast brick with high pressure in front and low pressure in the back, it's created by having a difference in air pressure between the top and the bottom of a car. Let's use the 350Z again and say there's a hypothetical one PSI less pressure on top than underneath. With a surface area of about 12,240 square inches, there'd be about 12,240 pounds of air pressure lifting the car up. That would suck. To get the desired downforce, we tapped into a phenomenon called Bernoulli's principle. And that says that a fast moving fluid will have lower pressure than a slower moving fluid. A wing mounted on a car generates downforce when air moves more quickly across the bottom of the wing than it does across the top. In this case, the fluid's the air. So the slower moving air across the top of the wing exerts more pressure than the faster moving air underneath, resulting in downforce. But how do we get the air to do that? Make the wing an airfoil shape. When air runs into a curved surface, it'll try to follow that surface. And that's called the Kuanda effect. Words, 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 words. And the direction you mount the wing determines whether or not positive or negative lift is generated. The air that has to travel further speeds up. And that creates a pressure imbalance that produces lift or negative lift, which is downforce. But what if your car has just got a little trunk spoiler tacked on the back? Well, it actually does something. Since the air follows a car's curved roof line down a bit and creates a fast and smooth flow, a lower pressure area of lift gets created around the rear end. The spoiler interferes with the airflow just a bit, helping to cancel out some of the lift. It spoils the airflow. It's a spoiler! <laughs> Anyway, they don't generate their own downforce, but that's why spoilers give you a little more high speed stability. And if you look at the Audi TT, which is kind of like a jelly bean cut in half, it was getting in accidents anything over 110 miles an hour. All they had to do was add a little baby spoiler. Problem solved. Say you got yourself a big wing. Now there's downforce pressing on your rear tires. What about the front? A lot of rear downforce itself can cause understeer, oh, and no one wants that. It had helped to balance things out to add downforce to the front tires using a splitter. Like our brick, air stacks up against the car's front end and creates a high pressure area before moving either over or under the body. When more air goes into that tight space under the car than the amount of air that goes over it, well, you're gonna have liftoff. Most production and street cars generate positive lift at high speed. And like the wing, you'd really rather have low pressure air go under the car, whilst high pressure air goes over the top. When a splitter is added, it increases the amount of area air can stack up against while helping more of it move over the car. Now with more pressure on top and lower pressure underneath, you've got a net 
downforce on those front tires. We mentioned earlier that there's not much aerodynamic drag at low speed. And that means there's hardly any downforce either. So as much as I want to believe it, the splitters and shopping cart wings really aren't doing much for the average daily drive. Oh. But the good news is that downforce increases exponentially with speed, just like that annoying drag does. So what do air dams, canards, under trays, side skirts, vortex generators and diffusers do? What? No, the people need to know this, Eddie. Side skirts, diffusers, vortex generators, canards? This is Aerodynamics Part 2, Son of Aerodynamics. Now that we've learned the aerodynamic basics of drag and lift, and how splitters, spoilers, and wings work, we can talk about what all those other cool aero things are doing. First, just a quick review. Previously on Science Garage. We saw that drag is the force air exerts against a car as it moves, while lift is the perpendicular force exerted by the air on the car. Today, we're mostly concerned with lift and its better half, downforce. Now how about that air? Damn. <laughs> air damn. The air dam usually has a couple of jobs. It directs more air over the top of the car than underneath to reduce lift, while also diverting air to the radiator to keep your car from overheating. On a sports car or a race car, the air dam is often designed to also shoot air directly into the intake, intercoolers, or oil coolers. It might route air through some ducts in the brakes to help cool those off too. The air dam also cuts down on overall drag, even on a boxy vehicle. Without it, the air would be tripped up by all the blocky shapes you usually find hiding behind that smooth bodywork on the front. On the corners of a race car's air dam, you might find canards, which are also called dive planes or dive plates. I don't know about you, but the word canard makes me think of ducks. No? That's just me? Canards are usually flat, wedge-shaped, and angled upward toward the back of the car. They direct the air that moves around the side of the air dam upwards, which creates a teensy-weensy bit of downforce. It's not much because they're so small, but it's enough to help fine-tune the balance between downforce on the front tires and the rear tires. Canards can also be used to deflect air around the front tires because they can be a source of drag, or they can be used to direct more air up into the wing's path at the back. Look, if you want to get super serious about downforce, it's the stuff that isn't as obvious as a sick front fascia or a shopping cart wing that can make the biggest difference. Underneath your car, there's a whole lot of nooks and crannies and junk like brake lines and exhaust pipes, and they're all meshing up the airflow. Adding a smooth under tray to cover up all that stuff goes a long way to reducing turbulence and drag. It lets the air move below the car much more quickly, and that reduces the air pressure and can enhance the downforce. But add a diffuser, and now we're really making sausage. I mean, downforce. A diffuser is typically a rear under tray shaped to make a gradually bigger space at the back of the car. But some race cars have front diffusers too. It activates what's called a Venturi effect, which is when a fluid speeds up as it flows through a more constricted area, like the space under your car. And remember Bernoulli's principle that says a fast moving fluid has lower pressure? Yup! That means even more downforce. As the space at the back of the car gradually increases in size thanks to the diffuser, all the fast moving low pressure air from underneath the car rushes up to fill that space. This helps draw even more air across the underside of your car. When it gets to the expansion area, it slows down and gains pressure. With high pressure surrounding the car on all sides and a lot less pressure underneath, an overall vacuum effect occurs, and it sucks the car down to the road. Now, that slowed down air can smoothly join back up with the slower, higher pressure air flowing all around the car. This gentle reunion 
reduces drag at the back, which results in even more downforce. Keeping the air flowing effortlessly without turbulence is what makes all of this work so well. So vertical dividers called strakes are placed in the diffuser to help keep the air orderly. As we learned in our first aero video, downforce from splitters and wings usually comes at the expense of a lot more drag. But adding a smooth undertray and a well-designed diffuser can reduce drag. So together, they're one of the most important ways to increase downforce. Like no one without a glass of milk, one without the other won't produce the desired effect. All right, we've created an area of higher pressure all around the top of the car and an area of really low pressure underneath. We're good to go, right? Wait, now all that high pressure air wants to rush into the low pressure area. And that is exactly what we don't want. And that is what side skirts are for. The ideal side skirts to extend as close to the ground as possible to block that high pressure air from sneaking back under the car and around the sides. That would increase lift and ruin the downforce that we just worked so hard to create. One of the most ingenious applications of underbody aerodynamics was Jim Hall's Chaparral 2J race car. The Can-Am series had just banned tall wings and moving aero devices for the 1970 season. So aero pioneer Hall developed some creative workarounds for his new car. Lexan side skirts were integrated with the suspension to maintain a constant one inch clearance with the ground, even around turns or over bumps. And its big boxy booty were two big fans driven by their own two stroke, two cylinder engine. The fans constantly pulled air through the underbody of the car, creating so much of a vacuum that the 2J produced up to one and a half G's of downforce. But since the Chaparral 2J's fans moved air independently of the car speed, it produced about the same amount of downforce at low speeds as it did at high speeds. This meant it could do lap times a full two seconds faster than the next fastest car. Competitors really didn't like that, nor did they like all the dust and rocks that the fans threw in their faces. His car was banned after just one season. Last but not least are those little vortex generators, and we're gonna talk about them in Mitsubishi Evo and Civic Type R terms, not F1 terms. Because let's be honest, you're not driving F1. So even though you can't see the air, we know pushing a car through it still causes some friction because it's got drag. Some air molecules get stuck near the surface in what's called the boundary layer. Meanwhile, the faster flowing air tries to follow the curved shape of the roof and rear window in what's called an attached flow. It would be perfect for the Evo and the Type R if the air smoothly and non draggily followed the window down, then flowed across the rear wing where it would generate downforce just like it's supposed to. But is that what happens? No! Instead, the attached flow peels off right around the end of the roof line and becomes a separated flow, dispersing off into the atmosphere where you can't even use it. That's why raindrops don't always blow off your back window when you're cruising down the freeway. There's just a swirling mess of turbulence. And that's not going to make any downforce when it gets to the wing. However, if vortex generators are placed in the stagnant area around the trailing edge of the roof where the air starts to separate, they, yes, generate vortices off of their tips. And that helps draw the fast moving air down into the boundary layer, which keeps the airflow attached for longer. So vortex generators are there on the Evo and Type R to make sure air passes over the rear wing and generates downforce. Aerodynamics. Thanks to Skillshare for sponsoring this episode. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands You probably know the difference between a station wagon 
and a hatchback, right? Well, how about a landolay and a brougham, hmm? Yeah, didn't think so. In today's episode, we're taking a look at all the different car styles out there. Big boys, small boys, pointy boys, everything in between. We're gonna give you the tools to identify different body styles, examine how they've evolved over time, and get to the bottom of why they're called what they're called. We're gonna keep this video to passenger vehicles, okay? Because commercial vehicles, motorcycles, vans, and trucks could be their own episodes entirely. But today, it's all about cars. I wanna give a huge thanks to Keeps. Uh, We're sponsoring this episode of Wheelhouse. No one really talks about it, but it's a fact that two out of three guys will experience some form of male pattern baldness by the time they're 35. I have what my mom has described as wonderfully thick and beautiful hair, but who knows how long these luscious locks are gonna last. I'm actually kind of nervous. When it comes to hair loss, prevention is key. And now, thanks to Keeps, I can maintain all the hair I already have and prevent hair loss without even going to the doctor. I can just visit a doctor online. They prescribe hair loss prevention medication and it's delivered right to my doorstep every three months. And Keeps is super affordable too. They offer the only two FDA approved generic hair loss products out there. You may have tried them before, but never at this low of a price. If you're ready to take action and prevent hair loss today, head on over to keeps.com slash wheelhouse50 or click the link in the description to receive 50% off your first order. That's K-E-E-P-S dot com slash wheelhouse and the number 50. Thank you, Keeps. Support the companies that support Donut and uh, take care of your hair. Now back to the show. Okay, so let's dive in with the car style most people are familiar with, the sedan. The main features of a conventional sedan are four doors, a three box configuration, a closed body, meaning a fixed roof, and the ability to comfortably see four or five passengers between two rows. Sedans get their name from this cool ass way to roll into a party. Wheelless, human powered contraptions have been around forever, and they're called something different all over the world. But in Britain, in the 1630s, a sophisticated version emerged called a sedan chair, or just a sedan. Some people think sedans were named after the French town of Sedan, but most of my etymologist homies think it simply derives from the Italian verb sedere, meaning to sit. There are differing opinions about who first used the word sedan in reference to a car body. Some credit it to the Studebaker 4 and 6 models, which were marketed as sedans in 1912. Others attribute it to Speedwell, a short-lived auto manufacturer based in Dayton, Ohio, who in 1911 used sedan to describe their new closed-body two-door car. Sedans are some of the most recognizable cars of the modern age. Sedans are so ubiquitous that before Australia and New Zealand adopted the term, they simply called sedans cars. This brings me to our next car style, the coo <laughs> coo or the coupe, or the coupe, depending on how you pronounce it. I say coupe because I'm a red-blooded American and can't say words like tutor, and because coupe sounds like a toupee for your car, and that just makes me, that makes me itchy. It gives me hives just thinking about it. Like sedans, coupes have a fixed roof and a three-box configuration, but are sportier and more compact, with two doors and a sloping or truncated rear roof line. Like a lot of car terms, the word coupe comes from our horse-drawn carriage predecessors. Stemming from the French verb coupe, meaning to cut, coupe was a type of clipped carriage that seated two instead of four, with its rear-facing seats essentially cut off, hence the name. The coupe body style has also given way to many variations as it's evolved. The sportiest of the already sporty coupes is the Berlinetta, introduced in the 1930s and popularized by Ferrari in the 1950s. On the other end of the spectrum is the business coupe, which had massive trunk space in lieu of a back seat. They became super popular with traveling salesmen. Everyone knows the Deuce Coupe, and who could forget the Cozy Coupe? Sedans and coupes may seem very different, so how has the line between them gotten so blurred? Well, you can thank car makers for getting willy freaking nilly with their naming conventions in the second half of the 20th century. The confusion started once manufacturers released coupes with a two and two body style, that is, 
two proper seats up front, two tiny little seats in the back. Then in the early 2000s, car makers were like, oh, this whole two and two thing not confusing enough for you? Well, check out these new four-door cars that we're gonna call coupes because we love chaos and nothing matters. Mercedes had their CLS class. Mazda had their RX-8 with the suicide doors on the back. So these quad coupes are at the heart of an age-old debate. Can you have a four-door coupe and a two-door sedan or does it defeat the purpose of terms altogether? You know what I'm gonna say? I'm gonna say, yeah. It does. Why use words if you're gonna take away their meaning? That's messed up. I'm looking at you, BMW. Let's take a look at the four-doored BMW X6. With its sleek roof line, you can see why it's marketed as a sports activity coupe. But that car is as much of a coupe as Dr. Phil is a real doctor. Yeah, he's not a doctor. Let's move on to the station wagon, also known as an estate car. Unlike the three-box design of the sedan and a coupe, Station wagons have a long-bodied two-box configuration. This means its passengers and cargo areas are in one joined cabin with the rear tailgate hinged to allow for easy access to all that junk in the trunk. The names station wagon and a state car harken back to these vehicles' original uses in the early 1900s, which was to transport travelers and their luggage between railway stations and country estates. So station wagons actually began as commercial vehicles before making their way into suburban life. Fancy that. These first generation station wagons are a great example of early custom work because it's not like you could just purchase one off the lot in 1910. Cab drivers with Ford Model Ts looking for more cargo space would have independent coach builders produce custom wooden bodies for their existing chassis. These converted wood bodied Model Ts were known as Woodies. Eventually, car makers got wise and started making their own station wagons. The first one assembled on a manufacturer's production line was the 1923 Star 4 Model C. C station wagon. Pretty dang cute, right? As time went on, manufacturers improved upon wooden bodies and replaced them with steel. The 1935 Chevy Suburban was the first all steel station wagon body, and by the early 50s, most other companies churning out station wagons had followed suit. Station wagon and estate models sold well in the 60s and 70s, but were eventually eclipsed by other family style cars in the 80s and 90s, like the minivan and the crossover SUV. Related to the station wagon is one of my personal favorites, the shooting brake. Now all my carriage heads out there will know that a shooting brake was originally a horse-drawn wagon used to cart around shooting parties along with all their guns and ammo and, I imagine, alcohol. This was back in the 1890s, but shooting brakes eventually came to mean a body style that combines the station wagon and the coupe. This was especially prevalent in the 60s and 70s. Companies offered these kind of two-door elongated sport coupes like the 65 Aston Martin DB5 shooting brake. Other companies offered the same body style but didn't call it a shooting brake like the Reliant Scimitar GTE, which sounds like a car from GTA. This style of car kind of disappeared for a while, but made a comeback in the 2000s. One of the coolest and weirdest looking of the bunch was nicknamed the Clown Shoe. It was the BMW Z3 M Coupe. And you can see why. Challenging the conventional definition, the later 2012 Mercedes-Benz CLS-class shooting brake had four doors instead of two. Ugh. And the more recent shooting brakes, the 2018 Porsche Panamera Sport Turismo and Ferrari's first production four-wheel drive model, the FF. People go ape shit for the FF, myself included. Also, the, the, the Panamera Turismo and that Mercedes, just call them wagons, guys. Come on. It's nearly impossible to talk about station wagons without bringing up the hatchback, named for its hatch-type rear door that opens upwards. Lots of early hatchbacks were actually marketed as small station wagons, like BMC's 1959 Countryman version of the Aston A40 Farina, predecessor to one of the most iconic hot hatches in history, the Renault 5 Turbo. The hatchback design actually dates back to the 1930s with the Citroen 11 CV Commercial, but the term hatchback didn't appear until the 70s when the cars really took off as popular small utilitarian vehicles, especially in Europe. Maybe the most well-known hatchback is the Volkswagen Golf, designed by the juggernaut genius Giorgetto Giugiaro, who in 1999 was named Car Designer of the Century. The Mark I Golf hit the scene in 1974 as VW's next big thing since the Beetle. Before long, it became standard for car companies to release hatchback versions of their most popular models. The hatch door style has even made its way into luxury vehicles like the BMW 5 Series Gran Turismo and the Audi A7. If you've ever heard a hatchback referred to as a three-door or a five-door, it's because the hatch is considered 
considered its own door in addition to the two or four existing passenger doors. Makes sense. That being said, what we see nowadays are more often the five door versions, especially in the US. We just don't like small cars for some reason, even though our cities are quite packed and parking's a nightmare. Okay, big stretch now. Oh. Because we're about to talk limos. The luxurious, lengthy limousine is popular with presidents, celebrities, and horny teenagers going to prom. It's driven by a chauffeur with a partition between the driver and the passenger compartments. Limos and stretch limos are made by converting the bodies of existing models. In the US, the most common conversions are cars like the Town Car, uh, the Navigator, the Cadillac XTS, and the Escalade, the Chrysler 300, and the Hummer H2. Entrepreneurial car nuts have even converted semis into the biggest functional limos in the world, but the longest limo of all time would have to be the 100 foot long, 26 wheeled American dream. Just look at this honker. Now look again, and this time, notice that there's a freaking helicopter on the back of it. It was created in 1992 by this dude, Jay Orberg, who is known for building movie cars like the DeLorean and Back to the Future. And the American Dream was both awe-inspiring and completely impractical. It was virtually undrivable and eventually fell into disrepair, but not before garnering the Guinness Book of World Records title of world's longest car. Well done, Jay. Like coupe, the word limousine is all wrapped up in carriage culture. It originally comes from the name of the French region limousine, where the shepherds wore a distinctive type of cloak with a raised hood. The roof that extended over the driver's seat on early limousines resembled that hood, which is how it's got its name. Originally, limos without a hood over the driver were called Brougham's. Cadillac was the first to make a motorized Brougham in 1916. But like most cars in this video, the meaning of Brougham has changed since the early days. Take the classic Cadillac Brougham land boat from the 1970s, a perfect example of Brougham being used on a car that doesn't actually feature this driver exposed passenger and closed body style that Brougham actually means. In the 1970s, 80s, and 90s, car companies would use Brougham to specify an upper trim level of a particular model. Chrysler did it with its New Yorker, Ford did it with its Ford Torino. So when it comes to car styles, the name Brougham can be a little tricky, but here's one that couldn't be any more straightforward. The micro car. It's a car that's micro. These tiny vehicles have little baby engines, generally 700 cubic centimeters or smaller many of which were originally designed for motorcycles. It's for that reason that many early microcars didn't even have the capability to go backwards. Microcars can either be four-wheeled like the BMW Izetta or three-wheeled like the microest of the micro, the PLP 50. Oh my God. Microcars cropped up after World War II, initially in Germany and the UK as an alternative to the motorcycle with better weather protection. One of the first to appear was the 1949 Bond mini car. This looks like something you'd buy your rich ass kid. It only weighed about 300 pounds, used a mere 50cc engine. One of the rarest microcars is the 1950s egg-shaped Brooch Mopetta. Mopetta, baby! Only 14 of these things were ever produced, and just five of them remain today. But when the Mini busted on the scene in 1959, microcar customers traded in their one-seaters for these roomier, more powerful vehicles that were still small and affordable. In the 90s, however, microcars made a little bit of a comeback with the itty-bitty Smart 4.2. Another styling variation that can dramatically affect the overall look of a car is the Fastback. A Fastback has a single, unbroken slope from the roof to the rear bumper that makes makes the car more sleek and aerodynamic. The precursor to modern day fastbacks are the teardrop shaped cars of the 1930s. And by the early 40s, you can get a fastback body style from nearly every domestic manufacturer. Fastbacks are usually coupes, but can be sedans like the old VW Bugs. An early fastback example is this stunning Bugatti Type 57 Atlantic, an extremely rare car. Uh, there's only a few of them in the world. One of them changed hands in 2010 for $40 million. Later fastbacks include the classic 67 Mustang, like the Bullet Mustang, the Mark I Plymouth Barracuda, the Kia Stinger is a fastback, and of course the Porsche 911, which has continuously maintained its fastback appearance from its debut in 1963 to today. Very impressive. Fastbacks can get confused with notchbacks, but the term notchback actually implies a horizontal trunk lid. It's usually reserved for distinguishing from fastback models of the same car. Like in the 1970s, the, there's a Chevy Vega, which came in both. Then there's the camback, also known as the camtail or k-tail. This automotive styling feature evolved out of an early 
desperately need for aerodynamic improvement on cars. A cam back slopes downward like a fastback, but then abruptly cuts vertically down. It's like it's it, it's it's like a fastback with the butt cut off. The most common cam back out there has to be the Toyota Prius, but the coolest is probably the Shelby Cobra Daytona Coupe. The design developed and named after German aerodynamicist Wunderbold Cam in the 1930s was found to minimize drag, reduce fuel consumption, and provide more vehicle stability at higher speeds. It was adding a cam back to the race car that finally allowed Ford to surpass Ferrari at Le Mans. Notable cam backs since then include the Ferrari 250 GTO of the 60s, the Datsun 240Z, and technically, Tesla's latest Model Y. You know that car body that's narrow at the center with a rounded front end and a voluptuous back end? I'm not talking about the peanut mobile. I'm talking about what you'd wash that big rock hard peanut down with. A refreshing bottle of Coke. Coke bottle styling can either be accomplished by pinching the waist of a car or adding more pronounced curves over the front and back wheel arches. Unlike other styles based on horse-drawn carriages, the Coke bottle design was inspired by aeronautics and the pinch-waisted fuselage of supersonic jets. The styling was named for its resemblance to a classic contoured Coke bottle laying on its side. It's not a far stretch, actually, seeing as both the bottle and the car style were developed by industrial design legend Raymond Lowy. ഈ വൈഷ്ണവ് സി കെ ജിജോ രാജ് ഫസിയുദ്ദീൻ മൂന്ന് പേരുണ്ടോ എവിടെ 